Hello and welcome to the Horizons Global Meeting 2022. My name is Sofia Karadima and I'm a senior editor and researcher at Endurance Monitor, which is a digital publication focusing on cross-border investments. This session is about the new energy economy transforming sustainability. I'm delighted to introduce you to our speakers today. And please feel free to send questions for them via the chat box. So let me introduce you to Adi Berlia, founder at Siron Abijay Journalism Foundation to Darius Gibasidic, Chief, Chief Executive Officer at Satis, to Devin Narang, Managing Director at Syndicatum Renewable Resource, and to Toby Tompkins, Founder and Chief Executive Officer at Safio. Welcome all, and thank Welcome. you for thank sharing you. The, your perspective today. I would like now. I would like now to hear more about how your role and experience is related to the new energy economy and to sustainability. Let's start with you, Toby. Thank you, Sophia, and good morning, everyone. Um, so I run. I am running an organization that looks at the issue of leadership on the blockchain. And, and I use that as a framework because I think that for all of the great intention and the great promise of any technology is really going to only be as effective and impactful um, in terms of how humans use it. So looking at impact leadership, what are some of the core new competencies to lead on the blockchain, how the blockchain really raises the bar for leadership in general. Thank you very much. How about um, you, Darius? So, Sophia, thank you very much for uh, this question. Actually, we've been uh, working in the sector of uh, training and man management in the area of aviation, and our role and uh, our task is to uh, move uh, a lot of uh, practical exercises and training operations from the uh, offline world to online world. So it means that uh, our one of our aims is to reduce the uh, emission and get into the uh, ideas of the uh, green uh, policy. Uh, so that's why we are working on that. And also it's one of our priorities on our agenda. Perfect. And let's hear now more from um, Devin. Uh, thank you, Sophia. Good morning. Uh, well, primarily we are focused on investing, operating uh, renewable energy plants in solar and bioenergy in India in the Philippines uh, and other parts of Southeast Asia. Uh, we also are looking at incorporating new technologies uh, to mitigate carbon and to help countries achieve net zero. Perfect. And I would like to turn to you, Adi. Brilliant. Um, apart from the fact that you know, they've, they've put my title as a co-founder of a journalism foundation, uh, I do wear a hat as a, a, a multinational business operator. And, and we consume a lot of energy, particularly in our chemicals and pharmaceutical business. So we work very closely with en en energy providers, supply grids, and particularly for achieving our, our ESG and sustainable goals. And uh, so we deep dive a lot into it. And I'm deeply passionate about the blockchain and uh, how its impact really can transform the world as well. Yeah, this is a very interesting topic. So now, before we start uh, discussing more about new energy and sustainability, I would like to ask to all uh, our attendees today to send questions for you. So the first question for, uh, from my side would be for Toby. Uh, building uh, a new economy involves transforming uh, the mindset of people, the mindset of our leaders. How can blockchain infrastructure encourage and develop current and future generation of leaders to lead with a sustainability and equity framework? What do you think? Oh, I think it's a, a great question. I think it really speaks to what is the vision of blockchain um, from the very beginning. And I think one of the things that makes blockchain unique from sort of the traditional trusted third party systems is that built into the DNA of blockchain is a vision of using blockchain to become a digital ledger for a better world. Now, to accomplish that, we must not only focus on the technical challenges and opportunities, but we also have to focus on the non-technical requirements for blockchain actors, especially leaders and other value creators. And so blockchain raises the leadership bar because it provides this immutable, transparent, and trustless environment that can track leadership and organizational transactions, decisions, and impact as they create value within their organizations. 
communities and beyond. And so what we do is try to focus on what are those new competencies? And it comes down to three core competencies. One is care. And that's care, mm -hmm. not just for your shareholders, but all stakeholders. Um, those that are not only um, in control or who own the blockchain, but also those who use it. Okay. Second is transparency. And that's one of the ones I'm most excited about. Um, and then the third is my twist on trustlessness. Now, trustlessness has a definition technically, but I also think it has um, a non-technical requirement, which is the ability of organizations and leaders to create systems that imbue um, in the same way that the autonomic nervous system allows us to not have to think about breathing and regulating our blood pressure. Organizations need to create trustless systems, policies, practices, um, and traditions so that things that we now worry about around equity and sustainability are things that we no longer have to question. One of those examples for me is salary transparency. Um, when you put in place salary transparency in the workplace, you eliminate so many conversations around bias and pay equity. You don't ever have to come to work worrying if your colleague is being paid differently because of some attribute that has absolutely nothing to do with the value proposition that they present because of their role and responsibility. So I think there's a lot that blockchain does to raise the bar for leadership. Definitely, and um, I really support your view on that. Now I would like to turn um, to David, and I would like to ask you, how should firms transform to be energy efficient uh, without sustainability goals? What is your view on this topic? Yeah, Sophia, again, a very good question. <clears throat> I think... Um, a lot of corporates globally have uh, virtually taken oath to become net zero uh, or, uh, as early as 2025, much before the countries have given their commitments. And a lot of these corporates, at least in the private sector, what we are experiencing in our part of the world is that they're reaching out to renewable energy producers, uh, linking with them and trying to reduce their carbon footprint. Uh, that is EA by supporting technologies or by supporting plants which uh, generate renewable energy. I'm talking at this moment about electricity. And also there is a huge movement in Africa and India for cooking stoves because this is again a game changer, both in terms of quality of life uh, and from an ESG perspective and from you know uh, re reducing, cutting down forests for cooking. So there are a lot of things happening globally. And of course, as Toby mentioned, uh, I'm a strong believer that uh, blockchain will be a game changer for CRs and VRs to be traded on. Uh, that is going to be a huge market. It is already $50 billion. It's going up to a, uh, about $100 billion. So corporates globally are very conscious. Uh, you know, you can look at Unilevers of the world or Apple or Microsoft who are doing their own bit to make sure that they can mitigate uh, carbon and they can reduce the carbon footprint. That's a very interesting approach to this. And what do you think, Adi? Do you agree with Devin? No, absolutely. And, you know, I'd like to put this in, in a little bit of context. I think what the uh, Russia-Ukraine crisis has reminded us that almost all problems we see in the world fundamentally are energy problems. Mm. Whether it's about trying to feed people, or uh, you know, trying to grow economies and countries. So we, it's a good reminder that how energy dependent we still are and how far away we are still from achieving these, these sustainability goals that we've all committed to. Now, what I love about the AI uh, and the blockchain and just, just taking from my uh, previous speakers, fundamentally our current problems are energy supply, energy distribution, both equitable and a cost-effective manner, and then the actual way of how we pay and consume energy. I'd like to divide this into two bits. One is AI. And what I love about AI is that, you know, for time a memorial, since we started using electricity, since we started using coal, oil, et cetera, there's been a mismatch between the types of supply and demand. And we're seeing this in renewables. When there is peak demand and peak supply, we've had a lot of stuff around battery technologies is and really figuring that out. And I think AI there plays a really large role in, in, in driving smart grids, managing the peaks, mm -hmm. looking at distribution efficiencies, and reacting much faster than perhaps humans could in really live managing loads, not just across a single neighborhood or a single 
a city, but across hopefully a much more interconnected wide energy grid all across the world. And that is something which I'm really looking forward to. And second for me, the blockchain. You know, one of the biggest things for us on the blockchain is, uh, you know, and Toby alluded to this, so this entire thing about transparency. One of the biggest problems we see in energy is this constant, but just because there's so much money involved, there's so much historical baggage involved. You know, what is the cost of energy? How does it transfer through the system? How are cross-border transactions uh, managed? And historically, it's been through a very large centralized route because historically large utilities and energy producers had to be centralized. But as you're moving to renewables, as you're moving to new forms of energy, we are seeing the need for a more decentralized system. And this system has to be underpinned by trust. And, mm. and, and the blockchain, with, 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 if not an open ledger, at least a trust-based handoff a ledger when required, allows us to create this trust between a wide disparate of producers and consumers, you know, whether it's home, solar, or businesses coming up, or, or, or you know, even certain things like micro-nuclear uh, or, or, or micro-clean coal and hydro, bringing those onto the grid, and particularly as we view borders going down in energy supplies. And this is something that is absolutely required, and it's wonderful that we have the blockchain. Last bit I'll say, and I love that everybody here is so focused on removing crypto from blockchain because I think we made a mistake on the higher energy consumption. I don't think that that was really intended. And um, I want to make clear that well-executed blockchain systems does not consume the type of energy <laughs> that perhaps you know the cryptocurrency world uh, is known for. Thank you very much for sharing your approach. And now I will turn to Darius. Darius, how do you find the key performance indicators to drive the new energy economy? Well, Sophia, thank you very much for your question. So at the beginning, I'd like to say that I uh, fully agree with uh, Aditya, and he mentioned two very important uh, things. The first one is the trust, and the second one is being dissent. Uh, usually, it has not been used in the um, area we are talking about right now, but it's a game changer right now, and we are facing new circumstances. And uh, actually, the war in the Ukraine just accelerated our uh, thinking about that and actually accelerated uh, accelerated our efforts <coughs> in this um, direction. It's also very important. And sometimes it's very difficult to put it into the frames of um, key performance indicators. But of course, we just uh, you know, have a kind of <coughs> set of them and try to measure the efficiency of that of our <coughs> actions. So <coughs> actually, uh, we should think about that uh, just from the perspective, whether it's efficient, whether it's, of course, technically feasible, feasible or whether it's uh, economically affordable. Uh, and also we should take into consideration that what was said uh, before and what I uh, mentioned. And so actually, uh, usually there are many factors or uh, many indicators like uh, primary energy savings. Uh, it's a key, it's an indicator which uh, allows to compare with uh, uh, quite uh, logical and rational uh, methodology and the uh, final uh, savings uh, generated by measures involving different uh, carriers, for example, thermal or uh, electrical energy savings. Also, we can use uh, energy <coughs> consumption improvement. Uh, that's an indica indicator which is used to assess the improvement of energy performance achieved with the efficiency uh, measure with respect to the condition before the implementation of certain method or certain uh, policy. So we can also use the indicator of the energy intensity. Uh, actually, it's used, uh, usually it's defined as the energy input used to obtain one unit of the product in output or, of course, uh, as well, it can be used the uh, renewable energy uh, use indicator, which uh, considers the percentage of the savings associated to the use of uh, renewable uh, energy sources. So actually, we've got like many possibilities. And of course, typically and usually, um, those indicators are uh, used in the frames of kind of uh, absolute values, for example, energy production from renewables or carbon dioxide mm -hmm. emissions or as a percentage uh, values cal calculated with respect to the reference scenario, so, mm -hmm. such like carbon dioxide re reduction or increase of the renewable share in the energy mix. So I think it's uh, like, it's a main point and uh, usually such indicators are used uh, in this area. 
It's a good point. Thank you very much. So, Adi, I would like now to turn to you and I would like to ask you what's needed to deliver the transition. We have seen a lot of announcements on green commitments and greening, but what can governments and investors do to deliver at pace? So, you know, I am going to say what, you know, and I think everybody sort of re- uh, obviously come out in, in 2022. I think we need, need to move beyond ideology and we need to move what is practical. And I think this is something that, that you know, 2021, 2022 has really thought of that, you know, while I love all the great thoughts and commitments about sustainability and, you know, re- 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 renewables and how do you create a positive energy grid, we have to realize two simple things. We have a massive amount of poverty in the world. We have a massive number of developing nations. And you have to figure out how do we meet our climate change and sustainability goals while at the same time not depriving them with the opportunity to grow their economies and which is primarily and still pretty much dependent on getting access uh, uh, to easy, cheap energy sources. Uh, In my opinion, having now studied almost every possible um, uh, energy source, its application, obviously it's a mix. But I think what more and more governments are figuring out that we need to really, really invest in technology, whether it is taking more percentages out of our existing systems. You know, I talked about AI in terms of distribution management, in terms of really making the energy distribution system more efficient to really investing uh, in utility systems, you know, getting more bang for our buck, you know, making sure that we are actively using in, and, and transforming our existing en- energy sources uh, uh, at a much higher convertible rate. And that could be solar uh, or that could be traditional oil. But majorly, we have to look at new sources. And, you know, nuclear is still, I believe, the holy grail of, of clean technology. And I think what I think what all governments could do, and now that we have seen especially what's happening in Europe, and we are seeing the energy crisis that, uh, that is unfolding out there, is that governments really need to figure out a new international plan of how do we bring nuclear back on the agenda. I think finally it, it has been acknowledged it is clean fuel. A lot of issues around waste management, storage, safety in the last 30 years have been taken care of. And certainly as we move to a nuclear fusion, in the sense that of course is the holy grail, and, but the joke it's always 25 years a- a- away. But uh, real investment in smart grid infrastructure, I think, connecting across borders, that's the new one. I mean, it's easier said than done, but if we can figure out how to talk between the energy consuming and supplying nations, but at the same time, taking a very pragmatic and serious approach to energy supply, with nuclear being a big part uh, uh, of the mix. It's a good point. And what, David, do you think about that? How should countries use renewable energy in order to reduce their carbon, fit, uh, carbon footprint and that it net zero? Yeah, you know, so I <clears throat> don't agree on the nuclear part with Aditya. Uh, I think the game changer which is going to happen in the world is storage, is actually battery storage. Uh, because if you need round-the-clock renewable energy power, you need to store the energy because both solar and wind are peaking. And now we have seen huge amount of development in terms of green hydrogen uh, and also of one world grid. Uh, Just last week, uh, India and Oman were in a discussion as a part of the minister's panel where they're discussing, uh, you know, how we could use countries with a fossil fuel based uh, generators, use more storage and where the electricity generation could be cheaper than other countries. And therefore, could there be a shift in storage from one place to another? And I believe in the future, you know, your storage, your house will be, uh, uh, will use uh, a battery the size of a mobile to uh, electrify your homes. The other game changer, which has not been mentioned, are EVs, electric, the, the vehicles. Now, this is going to be a big changer because let's not only focus on generation of electricity, but how can we reduce consumption of fuel? Um mm-hmm. And therefore, that is going to be a game changer uh, and charging station, which will use a lot of renewable energy. Now, what the source of renewable energy in the next five years or 10 years is going to be, I cannot say, because new technologies will come in uh, country specific. You know, if India or Africa have a lot of sun, so be it sun. If Europe has a lot of wind, it will be wind. 
uh, if uh, you know we need to transport ammonia for green hydrogen it's going to be green hydrogen for cement plants for steel plants so it has to be as a, like they said a combination of technologies which will come into play maybe nuclear plays a part, uh, plays a important part of it but it cannot uh, uh, i don't see it rising too much a lot of countries are moving away from nuclear but what we need is a base load power if you are talking of generation of electricity on which intermittent power can run and therefore storage to me becomes very critical and trust me as we speak uh, just 4 days ago i was looking at a technology which is which would be a game changer if they can commercialize to scale uh, because affordability becomes an issue in different countries uh, certainly a country like india cannot afford a very expensive power because the poor can't pay pay for it and then it goes into subsidies which is not the way out so when there is scale the prices will come down and it will become affro- affordable and therefore i see that most countries with a positive change in attitude and a passion uh, uh, with themselves can actually make a world a cleaner place it's a good point And now I would like to turn to you Darius. How can investors and policy makers help the energy sector to decarbonize, create jobs and contribute to the net zero? So I think policy makers and investors are closely linked because um, for investors is one of the most important things is uh, being sure <clears throat> what they can do and actually what are the legal or economic frames of their actions so uh, also we have to give a very a clear message that we want to do something we want to uh, change the entire environment and we want to move from the situation we are right now today to the new one which we plan to achieve uh, pretty soon. So actually uh, what uh, that's also very important thing which was said and we have to be aware of that 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 transition needs money. It's like very uh, simple and uh, it require it requires a huge amount of the capital which uh, can be spent on the energy. Of course um, from the investors we can say that the the policy is uh, bubbling because many countries have a net zero zero uh, pledge, pledges but no plan how to uh, how to get there and uh, have yet to square with the public that bills and taxes need to raise all right also a movable movable feast of subsidies for uh, renewables and regulatory and legal hurdles make investing in fossil fuel Uh, projects very risky that's what i w- w- that's what i said um, before that uh, being sure how the legal framework uh, looks like is very important of course for the investor and uh, ideal answer uh, is a global carbon uh, price that relentlessly lowers emissions helps uh, helps firms judge which project uh, would make money and raises and uh, tax revenues to support the energy uh, transitions uh, losers so uh, also we got to think about the uh, pricing uh, schemes which are designed in the uh, proper proper uh, way but also uh, just saying it uh, uh, in a short uh, we got to have a very precise and a clear uh, message of course uh, the states and the policy makers have got many instruments like uh, monetary instruments fiscal instruments tax instruments and so on just to uh, make this transition uh, reliable and make this transition uh, really happen in uh, our world Perfect. And Toby, now from your side, what is the role of blockchain within the energy transition? What opportunities and barriers do you see there? Thank you. Thank you, Sophia. I, I had to give some thought to this one because I think that um, there are a couple of challenges that I think we don't talk about. Um, I mean, but let's talk about role. I mean, so... So I think, you know, blockchain is a promising tool, right? It, it, it facilitates transactions between generators and consumers of energy. Um, so we, we, it, we see the peer-to-peer opportunity around electricity trading, selling of excess renewable energy to other network participants. We see things like buying and acting a, as a certification tool for renewable green energy. Those are all wonderful roles that blockchain can play. And, and, and it also presents some real economic opportunities, both throughout the ecosystem at the global and local level, like reduction of transaction tr- cost, which, of course, benefits communities from margin to center. 
Um, it also, the, because of cryptography, and, and Adi referred to this, um, it actually increases security um, of, the, of the transactions and, and transparency. Um, it allows for electric customers and other prosumer communities to generate electricity and sell it back. And, and it strengthens the transition through these P2P networks that enable trustless and timeless and verifiable microgrids to manage transactions. So when you talk about a one grid world, um, it's overwhelming to think about, well, well, how do I track that? Um, so a lot of opportunities. I think the challenges um, or the barriers um, kind of line up around what are some of the biggest barriers around energy transition. And, and Adi pointed to some of them, energy mix and grid flexibility requirements being one. Um, EV charging infrastructure and, and the need for long-term backup capacity, all things we've talked about. But I also believe that there are non-technical um, barriers that will be represent the greatest challenge to the full adoption of blockchain adoption in the energy transition. And I believe the two biggest ones are full stakeholder engagement, ensuring that all stakeholders, communities, and consumers are fully engaged and have agency in the equitable and just allocation of blocking-based energy distribution. Um, and I do think that DAOs, distributed decentralized autonomous organizations, can be a really great solution for, for, for this barrier if they are set up in a way that everyone gets equal voice and equal vote around, around some of the critical decisions that produce an adverse impact in one community at the benefit of another. Um, the other is transparent and real-time impact assessment and reporting. So all participants in the energy transition ecosystem from consumer to provider should have full and unfettered access to real-time data at the individual group and community level that is evaluated against a shared group of core values and entitlements. And I think smart contracts can be a really powerful and trustless solution there as well. So I think there's a lot of stuff that we're not talking about. We need to not just measure impact, i.e. we talk about the value of, of um, you know, renewable energy, and, we, and, and that's great. And, you know, in Portugal, everything's about electric cars. What we don't talk about is the adverse impact of having to mine one mile of copper for the, as an average for the production of every car. And who does that impact? Well, it impacts the most marginalized countries. It impacts the global south. It impacts emerging markets in Africa and, and Latin America. And we need to measure the full conversation around impact. And if we don't do that, then we're going to be creating only half of the story. Definitely. Before moving to our Q&A session, I would like to ask all attendees to send questions from you, for you. But before that, uh, you have previously mentioned about the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the issues that they have come up. So, Adi, I would like to ask you, how has the Russian invasion of Ukraine impacted on the energy sector? What are the challenges? So I think it's done a few things. One, I think it's reminded people, uh, you know, uh, that how core energy is, uh, you know, to the, to the functioning of the global economy. We are seeing because of rise of oil prices, uh, you know, devastating effects all across the world, whether it's in food security, uh, country uh, stabilization, inflationary hits all across the board, and, you know, massive knocks on the entire infrastructure. Everything is just going up and more expensive. I think that's a very good reminder to all of us that, you know, uh, to move away from an ideological purview of how we view energy and sustainability into one that is more pragmatic and one that is more realistic. I think, you know, and, you know, I... I, I love what you pointed as well. You know, one of the big things is about supply chains. Uh, you know, if you're talking about renewable energy and storage right now, and I'm really hoping there's some amazing technologies coming down in uh, maybe in three to five years, you know, a lot of it depends is getting rare earth materials, getting a large amount of commodities. Many of these are in countries which are not part of the global ecosystem as much as they were maybe three to five years ago. And there's huge issues in, in you know, mining these materials, a lot of pollution. There's a lot of unsustainable methodology around there. So I think suddenly people woke up to understanding that a lot of the materials that we used, uh, you know, in, in solar, in nickel, in batteries, in EVs, are in places which are difficult to get. So all you're doing is moving a geopolitical issue from oil to a geopolitical issue on these other commodities and materials. 
I think that's a great wake up call for everybody. And so for me, back to two, three very simple points. One, so let's get pragmatic and talk about how do we meet our sustainable goals. I think nuclear, again, is something that I really, really have started to advocate for right now. Countries like the UAE, which is oil surplus, are rapidly transitioning their entire economy. They've just launched a couple of new nuclear reactors. And in the next 10 to 20 years, that's the path they are taking. Second is, is, is you know, really understanding trust of trust and supply. One of the biggest problems that we're seeing is that moving to a sustainable system. You start about pumping and oil, sending it to a refinery, and then doing downstream processing. Mm -hmm. The supply chain for sustainability is a lot more complicated. There are a lot mm -hmm. more material involved, a lot more actors involved. And I think here is something where we, where, where you know, blockchain, particularly around connecting global suppliers and really, you know, configuring supply and demand rather than hoarding and these horrible peaks that we see, even in terms of how we look at uh, uh, commodity supplies can really help. And, and I think third, countries need to start talking to their citizens of, of energy sustainability in terms of energy security as well. I mean, if you look at wind and nuclear, uh, wind, nuclear, solar, it's, you know, a, a lot of times they were saying, well, we don't need to invest in this because we can just buy energy across the border at XYZ. And you suddenly wake up one morning and you can't buy it anymore. You know, what does energy self-sufficiency look like? You know, and especially for countries who don't have access to oil, who, who, who don't have access to coal, uh, you basically have to bet on new source of energy that in, that's a large part of re re renewables. And again, uh, as, as a base function, uh, mm -hmm. nuclear, I don't see in current form, at least the next five years, battery and storage technology right now really doing that. Uh, but I do see in maybe 10 years' time amazing new energy storage systems coming up that will hopefully help. So I'll leave it at that. You know, it's a yes. entire creation of conflict there. Yes, but uh, again, on the conflict side, I would like to ask Darius a little bit about that. So from your side, how do you think that there is the best way to discourage the states from using Russian supplies? So actually, I also fully agree with uh, Adia what uh, he said, and this is kind of wake up call that we are facing right now. But also there is a uh, question and the thing we should uh, consider because uh, the issue is not to uh, just find a new sources of old energy, but the issue is to find a, a sources of the new energy. We, could, we should start thinking about the a transformation and actually deploying the uh, policy. Uh, when we, we talk about discouraging uh, countries from uh, taking and uh, receiving uh, energy uh, from uh, Russia, I think uh, we can see that right now on the uh, international agenda, so uh, arena also, uh, because uh, there are many uh, measures uh, which were implemented right now internationally and locally, and also there is, a, of course, a leading, a leading role of the uh, actual states right now in this situation, but also uh, it has been followed, that policy it has been followed also by almost all European uh, countries. Of course, uh, we uh, also, uh, we should think practically, as you said, uh, about uh, the situation right now. But anyway, we should uh, do our best efforts to actually uh, do everything just to behave in the uh, decent, decent way and actually uh, do everything not to finance uh, the war. And as it was uh, said, there are many, many, I would say international also measures and instruments which are implemented and deployed right now, and they they actually work maybe not not to the full extent, but uh, it's it's happening uh, just in front of our eyes. Yes, that's a good approach. And David, from your uh, side, like several countries are looking to reduce their reliance on Russian supplies. What does the mean? What does this mean for sustainability and transition to a low carbon economy? Uh, Sophia, I think there is more, none of us on this panel are experts on why the Ukraine, uh, why the uh, sort of war took place. Uh, and your question, uh, you know, if s countries which are most, the whole world is dependent upon fossil fuel at the moment. So you cannot wish it away. You know, you cannot tomorrow stop driving a car uh, which uses petrol or diesel. I mean, it is there whether we like it or we don't like it. 
it is how fast can you move away from fossil fuel into something which is cleaner is the question mark and that is happening faster than we can think now i can say that with confidence because i am in an industry which is seeing this every second what is happening globally connected where the world is heading and the only way to uh, really uh, push fossil fuels out is to quickly adopt technology i will just give you a 30 second example uh, which so india was buying uh, led bulbs that i'm i'm not converting but let's say for the sake of conversion uh, so 500 rupees a bulb or 700 rupees which is 10 dollars a bulb led bulb the minister came and he piyush goel was the earlier minister and he uh, he increased the market demand to 300 million led bulbs guess what happened to the price the price from 10 dollars came to 50 cents because okay. now similarly we have seen a high drop in renewable energy price prices as we go and i still believe that battery technology will happen storage will happen sooner than later and the only way to do is is that people globally would have to move make a conscious decision to move away from fossil fuels into i'm talking of ev vehicles now electric vehicles now they have to do it uh, we have no choice uh, you have seen where the uh, uh, prices have gone this is very bad for energy security look at sri lanka they have literally half a days petrol left in the country i mean you can imagine the kind of crisis they will and you can imagine what is going to happen to a lot of countries in europe who are dependent upon energy source from russia if they choose not to take it that they will need an alternative source which could be very expensive and which will dent their economy uh, very badly so those are choices people have to take germany continues to buy uh, russian energy they you cannot stop it overnight it may take 6 months may take 9 months what happens in 6 months time i can't say so you know uh, countries have to take their own toll depending upon the economy uh, and their ability to pay for an alternative source which could be more expensive or an alternative supply which could be more expensive yes that's a good point and toby from your side like we have heard that several countries are looking to stop using russian supplies however there is the risk that a russian cut ta- can cut off its supplies to europe to full extent what do you think about that <laughs> well they say in crisis there is opportunity <laughs> and i think you don't see the opportunity until you're in the middle of the storm i think that uh I mean it, I was afraid I was going to get this question <laughs> and I like I think Devin said I I don't feel um that I understand the geopolitics well enough but what I can say is this um there's we have to look at the way in which European countries and I live in one and and a lot of countries in the west are really really overextended in their use of energy um in their waste of energy in the excesses that we all live by and i think one of the things that i think that we can do better is to it's more than just turning off your lights when you leave the room um and i think there's a lot of opportunity in that personal responsibility and accountability space that we can unpack and that can enable us to to bear the 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 discomfort of a, a scenario like that happening The other thing that I think is important to realize is um freedom of from anything comes at a cost. And it comes at a reconfiguration of how we utilize any asset that we've come to overrely on. And there is an overreliance on fossil fuels um in the world. Um and and the consequence for that is that we have allowed ourselves to get in a position where if the person who controls that um pulls it from us we all suffer but i think the lesson is that energy in general sh- i don't believe should be centralized so if i have one concern about the nuclear platform that you talk about adi is that how do we make sure that l- nuclear energy which is clean i agree is also decentralized so that it can be accessible and it can't find itself in the province of one great power who can use and wield that at their will. So I think there's a lot that we will learn from how this will play out. 
I think that um, there will be some suffering, but I think in those moments, those who can share their energy supply with other countries who are suffering, whether it's in Europe or anywhere around the world, should do so. Those who um, can change their habits and behaviors will be called upon to do so. These are human solutions to political problems, not technical solutions. Yes, thank you very much for sharing your perspective. So now we have a few minutes before the end of our panel. So I would like to ask all of you before wrapping up to share with me your final thoughts. So in 30 seconds each. So let's start with you, Adi. Sure. Uh, no, uh, up, yeah, so the okay. second bit, you have, you have to be practical. It's immensely doable and solvable. And I think blockchain AI plays a great role. I think we all can agree, um, you know, decentralization, giving more power to people, uh, creating more uh, connected but trusted uh, networks is the way to go. I'm going to take five seconds to respond to Toby on this. You know, for, for me, and I highly encourage everyone to look at what new nuclear looks like. Smaller micronuclear plants, one megawatt, five megawatt plants that can, e that, uh, that can be safely done even at the neighborhood scale without the so-called huge nuclear that we are used to in 30 years. But just like this, I'm sure there are a huge number of other technologies, geothermal, waves, and all that are coming in. And so when we look at a future, we have to look at a, a considered energy mix. And mm -hmm. to connect that all together, we need technology. And I think that's where smart grids, AI, and blockchain truly will make a difference. That's a very good point. And now, Darius, for you, like in 30 seconds, what are your final thoughts? So thank you very much. Actually, I fully agree with uh, also with uh, Toby, and I would like to stress that uh, we should do everything to make the new sources of energy uh, commonly available, and also that the countries which are uh, richer countries should uh, do in some way help the countries which uh, have got problems with uh, getting uh, the transformation on the fast lane. So it's also very important. And right now also, we get to think about uh, our planet and uh, our climate, but also we uh, should think should be thinking about uh, how to cut off the reliance on the energy from the countries which are uh, autocratic or which are the regimes like uh, Russia in nowadays. So thank you. Yes, thank you very much. And now let's turn to David. Uh, well, 30 seconds. I think the world needs to aggressively follow what is set with agenda in COP26 is, uh, followed by COP27, which is this year in Egypt, and next year I believe it's in Dubai. So I think the world needs to up its commitment globally. Uh, and actually it helps, you know, if countries which have more access to capital and to debt can help other countries or islands to become more renewable, to become cleaner. It indirectly helps that economy also because business would then flow between two countries. And therefore, it, uh, you know, so it need not be a subsidy. It could be some way or the other because, uh, you know, a, a problem, let's say, in one part of the world can affect now, it can, tra can uh, transfer to any part of the world. I mean, look at the pandemic started from where and, you know, where it's gone. So even uh, climate change and climate disasters are going to have an effect globally. It's not limited to a particular country. It will lead to migration. It can lead to a number of other things, you know, oceans, temperature going up, oceans rising, water disappearing. So exactly. it's all, you, you know, you've just got to focus. You've got to think the world as one place and not as uh, a separate place. Yes, I agree with you. And what about you, Toby? In 30 seconds, what are your final thoughts? Um, I, I don't really have much more to, more to add. I do think that um, the system has to expand in terms of blockchain, not just measuring issues of impact, um, but also looking at more holistically what, an, what adverse impact looks like as a result of the things that we're focusing on. So if we're focusing on the reduction of fossil fuels, what adverse impact is created in that in other systems with other communities, et cetera, et cetera. It, it doesn't benefit us holistically or as a planet to solve one problem and create three others. And I, and I do see some of that happening in this conversation, not in this conversation, but in the larger energy transition conversation. And then the overall conversation about how we get to net zero by 2050. 
Thank you very much for making. Thank you very much for sharing your thoughts. Thank you very much for making yourself available for panel discussion and also for being open to these questions. Thank you all for tuning in. So please stay with us because there are much more to come in the program today. Thank you all for tuning in. Thank you very very much. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.